Before we get started, a couple quick notes and a couple clean house items. First and foremost, this is all about you guys. This is meant to be a small, intimate group where you can ask your questions of them uh, throughout the entire programming. So we have uh, the question and answers in the below. Uh, Carrie might be seeing those. Carrie, I can't see the Q&A, just FYI. Um, but please put your questions in the Q&A section. We will moderate those into the, um, the final 10 minutes or whatever throughout the programming. We want to know what is on your mind and what questions you have. Uh, and second of all, and, and very importantly, sponsors, we want to give a huge spot, uh, thank you and spotlight on our presenting sponsor for the second year, Delta Dental Michigan, who is, uh, they are a dental insurance company, but they are highly committed to building a healthy, smart, vibrant community for all. And we think oral health, but in reality, it's not an isolated issue, very much not, not so. Uh, very much tied to public health, education, economic development, uh, really confounded by underlying issues like poverty, access to healthcare and education. So we're so grateful that for Delta Dental's work that benefits nearly a, a million people every year. Um, and special thanks to them for not only supporting us, but all of their community partnerships uh, where they are actively helping create better places to live, work and play. I'm going to give them a quick uh, commercial and then we're going to get to our programming. Okay, without further ado, I want to introduce our two guests today, uh, Stephen Henderson and Nolan Finley. They are icons in the city of Detroit. Uh, I'm lucky enough to call them friends. And they have their longtime journalists and unlikely friends themselves. I'll let them tell you a little bit about their background. I'm sure that's part of um, what they're going to talk about. But in reality, what they come from vastly different backgrounds, politics and perspectives. But they have, they share a love of bourbon and that really taught them to learn to listen well and, and just listen to each other and fully try to understand uh, each other in order to build understanding, respect, and ultimately civility. So today we're talking about civility, how it has a place in the workplace and, um, and, and how you can embrace it and move forward with it, not only in your life, but obviously in the workplace as well. So with that, I'll let you guys take it over. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thanks for having us, Karen. Pleasure. You gonna go first, Nolan? I could. Um, Steve, and I, <laughs> Steve and I have, and, I, and we only have a half hour, and this program usually runs an hour or so, so we're gonna talk fast and condense it down. But Steve and I um, are co-founders of the Civility Project, an effort, uh, we got underway uh, formally over the last year, year and a half, really. Um, but informally, something we've been working on a long time. Uh, we've been friends for a long time, as Carrie noted, unlikely friends because of our differences. I'm the editorial page editor of the Detroit News. Um, Steve was a conservative paper. Steve was the editorial page editor for a long time of the Detroit Free Press, a progressive paper. And folks used to like to put us together, still do put us together and watch us fight on TV and the radio and other places. And we did that and still do and do it very well. But over the course of that, we also discovered that we had a very um, enduring and deep friendship, which didn't surprise us as much as it seemed to surprise other people. And people always asked us, well, you know, how do you guys do it? How do you guys remain close despite your deep differences on every single issue? and sometimes very passionate, often very passionate differences. 
we scrap a lot and uh, you know and you know we started thinking about it ourselves and realized you know it's not accidental it's intentional and there are things you can do to uh, maintain civility across your uh, political differences but not only that remain maintain relationships and close relationships and I think that's one of the things at risk today uh, as we are in such divisive bitter times uh, the idea that uh, uh, are these differences may may divide us politically but they don't have to separate us as people and you know one of the things we're what concerned us the reason we thought it was worthwhile doing is because there's so much hate out there now and we're trying to get people beyond their hate and to the point where they can actually converse and interact civilly yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, like Nolan said, uh, this has been something that the two of us have been working on um, between the two of us for about 15 years now, um, uh, beginning when I came back to Detroit um, from a long stint living on the East Coast and, and uh, became the, the editorial page editor at the, at the Free Press. And, you know, there is this natural tension between the two of us. Uh, we see things in really, really different ways. Uh, almost everything. I mean, we could throw almost any issue out in front of the two of us and we'd, we'd scrap over it. Um, uh, but, you know, we did learn over time that, that, that there was more to the relationship than that and that we actually liked each other and respected each other. Um, and one of the things that really, I think, was a turning point in, in the relationship between me and Nolan, and this is a big part of what we try to push with the Civility Project, uh, is an exercise we did about four years ago um, as part of uh, StoryCorps, which is a, a national project by NPR to try to collect stories, uh, narratives about American relationships. And they go city to city and invite people to come down with somebody who is important to them. And they go and uh, spend an hour talking about the relationship that they have. They talk about why the relationship exists. They talk about the strains in the relationship. Uh, they talk about milestone moments in those uh, relationships. Most people do this with family members or they do it with their spouses. Um, I decided that I wanted to do this with Nolan, um, <laughs> which was kind of an unconventional choice. Um, but <laughs> what I told him was that I wanted us to go and not talk about the things that we always fight about, not have the same argument that we always have, but I wanted us to talk about where the things that we believe actually come from. Um, uh, what makes me a progressive or a liberal? Uh, what are the experiences that I had? What are the things that I saw and did growing up that led me to believe that that's the right way to see the world and that's the right way to solve problems? And the same question um, was, uh, was what I wanted to hear the answer to from Nolan. What makes him a conservative? Why does he see that as the right way to, to try to solve problems or think through things. Um, and so we spent an hour just talking about who we were um, to each other after working together and being friends for almost a decade. Um, and we learned stuff that we didn't know <laughs> about the other person. Um, but I think we also came away with a, with a deeper appreciation of, uh, of our differences, but also uh, uh, of each other that, that um, I think it was more ingrained in our minds after that, uh, that, that the disagreements we have aren't about um, uh, antipathy or uh, mean-spiritedness. Uh, they, are, they are genuine, different perspectives born of different experiences um, throughout a lifetime. And so I think it makes it a lot harder for us uh, after that happened to, to, to devolve into, um, you know, uncivil uh, debate. I mean, I think there's always in the back of our minds this knowledge now of who the other is and why they are doing what they're doing. And, and so that's a huge part of what we're encouraging with the Civility Project is get to know people you don't agree with and not just know them for what their opinions are, but know who they are as people and know where these opinions actually come from. And it gives you a deeper understanding of their positions, but also gives you a deeper appreciation of them 
uh, as human beings uh, and as fellow Americans. You know, one of the things I talk about all the time with civility is, you know, the democratic process relies on us being able to, to have civil disagreement. It, it, it counts on us having disagreements. Right. Uh, but in order to solve those problems, in order to come up with solutions, you've got to be able to talk to people you really disagree with and whose, whose ideas you made to test. Um, uh, you've got to be able to talk to them about it. You've got to be able to do it without insulting or devolving into, you know, fisticuffs or, or, or other kinds of uh, uncivil exchanges. And, and, you know, that is the core principle of the civility project. We believe that, as Steve said, everybody comes to their opinion in the same way. They take the facts, the information at hand, they apply their own experiences and values, come up with opinion. And if it's, their opinion is different than yours, it doesn't make them ignorant, evil, sinister. Just, you know, they're just different. And we ask people before they start talking about politics to do what we did, sit down across from each other and ask questions of each other, honest questions about your background, about your values, about your experience, about the things that might shape your political opinion. And then from there, go into a conversation that, uh, that is you know, base, built on that foundation of knowledge and respect, because I think respect is essential. Um, and a lot of us probably think we can't respect anybody who doesn't have hold our same political views. And, you know, there's some disturbing, you know, uh, trends out there. Before the last election, 70% uh, of people said they don't have a friend across the political divide. Uh, 40, 50% of the people, almost 50% of the people said uh, they never have a conversation with anyone who doesn't uh, believe like they do because they're afraid. And so we're trying to break down that fear uh, and build the respect. And then, you know, we ask people to set an honest goal for the conversation. Once you sit down across from each other, uh, what do you want to accomplish? And if in your mind, if that goal is, oh, I just want to win, I want to score points, I want to beat that other person into the ground with the superiority of my argument, uh, don't bother. You're not going to convert anyone, and your goal shouldn't be to convert. A conversation is not a competition. Set honest goals. You want to learn something about the other person. You want them to hear you, and you want to hear them. Uh, you know, you're not out necessarily to change minds, but you could shape your better shape your own own opinions. You could add texture and context to your own uh, position and your own opinion by listening to the other person and having honest back and forth that isn't about uh, a takedown. And too often, that's where our conversations are today. Uh, you know, we talk about kind of core principles um, when we talk about civility and the things that we think um, uh, are the basis for, for civil exchanges and relationships. Uh, and we've been talking about some of them, you know, knowing, um, knowing more about the person you're talking to, uh, setting reasonable expectations for your exchanges. Uh, but, but probably at the top of the list, I think, in terms of the, the principles that we think make up uh, civil exchanges uh, is, is the concept of listening. Um, and, um, you know, when we use that word, <clears throat> I think we mean something a little different than most of us uh, think of when we think about our lives. Uh, um, I think a lot of times we think we're listening when we're not talking, uh, if we're allowing somebody else uh, to have their say. But, but I also, I think it goes a little further than that. I mean, I think sometimes uh, when we're not talking and allowing someone else to talk, we're still in our own heads. Uh, we're in our own heads about what we're gonna say as soon as that other person stops talking. Uh, or we're in our heads about what we just said uh, to that person and thinking, maybe I need to repeat that or maybe there's a better way to say that. Or we're in our heads about what that person was saying and judging it, um, you know, deciding as they're talking that there's no, there's no merit or value to what they're saying. Um, I think the listening that we're encouraging people to do that we try to do uh, is a little more active. It really is about investing in what the other person is saying, where they're coming from, really trying to put yourself 
uh, a little bit in their position and understand why do they think this? Where did they come up with this? Uh, and why does this make sense uh, from their perspective? Um, you know, it really is about um, giving up a little of yourself and your self-awareness and self-consciousness to try to to try to empathize and understand somebody else. Um, and I always have two really important tests of whether I'm doing that. And I have to say, as somebody who listens for a living, um, you know, I catch myself not listening uh, sometimes the way I should. Uh, and so, you know, I do have tests for myself to, to just to make sure that I'm doing it the right way. The first test I have is uh, after someone's talking, done talking, you know, could I repeat back to them pretty much what they said? I mean, not word for word, but um, but but really reconstruct the ideas that they laid out, uh, and not in a dismissive or mocking way, but but in a good faith way to really say, here's what this person was trying to communicate. Um, and so, if I can do that, I think I'm I'm listening in in the right way. <laughs> and then the other test I always have is whether I have questions for somebody after they've stopped talking. Um, do I want to know more about what they're saying? Is there something that they said that I want to take them back to and say, hey, there's one thing you said that really kind of caught my attention. I don't know any much about that or don't understand it. Let's talk more about that. Um, when I'm really listening, I have questions. I have a lot of questions for the person I'm talking to about what they've said. Uh, and when I'm not listening in the right way, I think uh, I move on pretty quickly to, to the next thing that I want to say. And so, uh, you know, we really encourage the idea of staying on top of yourself um, and the way you're participating in a conversation um, by listening, actively listening uh, to the person that you're, that you're having the exchange with. And I would add to that, uh, lose your sense of superiority, lose your smugness. Uh, you know, a lot of us go in and say, I got the facts on my side, I'm right. I got the truth on my side. I'm the only one who talks to God. And, you know, they shut off the other person and they make assumptions about how they feel about people based on what they think they know about them. And that happens, Steve and I, all the time. Um, get, we get letters based on what we write, based on what we say uh, on, on the airwaves. Uh, oh God, we just hate you, you know, and just bitterly hate us. And they don't know us. You know, and sometimes when they do know us, they hate us. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a tendency to to take someone's politics and judge them um, as the whole. I mean, that's the whole of them. And I always tell the story uh, about the time Steve and I were on Mackinac Island uh, for the Republican State Convention. Not a comfortable place for Steve. Uh, but we were late night. We were late night at a bar on the island, standing together at the bar. And I walk away and these two Republican ladies jump me and say, I knew him. And they say, God, how could you be friends with him? How could you be talking to him? He's so awful. And, uh, and I said, well, do you know Steve? And, and they said, no, we've never met him. I said, well, how could you make that? How can you draw that conclusion? And I said, why don't you go talk to him? Um, go spend a little time with him and uh, let me know what you think. It was like two hours later. I mean, I had to drag them off Steve and they're, they're like, oh, he's so wonderful. We love him so much. He's just so great. His opinions hadn't changed. Their opinions hadn't changed. They just took the time to step beyond politics and get to know him as a person. And if we're willing to do that, I think uh, we, we, we could surprise ourselves. We might broaden our our group of friendship, friend, friends, because it is important to have people in your lives who don't agree with you and who you can civilly discuss your disagreements. You know, we all have relatives we, oh, we can't sit down at the um, Thanksgiving table with, you know, or we think we can't, but it's, it's still good to have people in your lives who aren't simply echoing your opinions, who challenge you, make you think, make you go a little bit deeper in, um, uh, in, in the formation of your viewpoints. That's what Steve does for me. Hopefully I do for him. And it's good to have that. 
uh, and knowing that it's safe to do, that the relationship's not at risk, that you may walk away mad, but you don't walk away for good. Yeah. And I, I know we want to get to questions and we're a little short on time, but but I, I really want to emphasize that point about not walking away. Um, that's a key part of at least the relationship that uh, Nolan and I have, and it's a, a really key part of the professional relationship. I mean, if you've ever seen us on TV or heard us on radio or seen us in a live event, I mean, you know, we can get at it. Um, I mean, we really get after each other. And there's times when uh, the argument is not just uh, 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 passionate, it can, it can grow angry sometimes. Um, and the reason that's okay, and the reason we are able to do that uh, is because we have a commitment to something larger than whatever it is that we're arguing about. I mean, we have a commitment to the idea that we want to have this exchange and that we want to have this exchange over a long period of time. Um, and so there is no one argument that we would allow uh, to destroy that. Um, you, can, you can stop the argument because you don't think it's productive anymore. You can walk away from the argument because it's reached a point of, of destructive rather than productive exchange, uh, but you always come back. And, and neither one of us has ever gotten up from the table or the stage and said, you know, I'm, I'm done with that guy. I am not doing this anymore. And, you know, sometimes that's harder than others, <laughs> uh, but, but that's the commitment. I mean, that's the, 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 the thing that makes it civil. It makes it, it makes it possible for us to have genuinely um, uh, passionate um, and even angry exchanges uh, without jeopardizing uh, that relationship. And that's an important part of civility too. We're not talking about getting along, We're not talking about agreeing. We're talking about being able to disagree vehemently uh, without destroying a relationship. Stephen said, uh, please put your questions in chat. And we have a couple that have come in already and from registration. And I, I personally feel like this, this past year has been a true challenge for me. Um, and so someone else touched on it and I'll put my personal spin on it too, where I feel like you can be so much more productive when you are person to person, like when you know someone, but when it's just, when you're all hiding behind a screen, it allows you to say more. It allows you to think more. And I just, I have found it personally very hard to, I have a lot of people that I do not agree with politically. I can appreciate, uh, I, I keep them as like friends on Facebook, on, on Instagram or whatever, because I like seeing that other perspective. But at some point it's just like, it's too much and it's hard when you're not humanizing. That's the right terminology for it. What, what do you say to that in this time when we're all, yeah, we're coming out a little bit more, but I think ultimately you're always going to have the people hiding behind the screen which allows them to say more and then for you to maybe say more or think more. Yeah. And well, don't, don't come out with your dukes up, you know? I mean, we, there's a lot of things. <laughs> come out glad to sort of be out with people. Uh, I, you know, I was out the other night and it's just um, amazed me how my social skills had it throw atrophied. I just like, <laughs> what do I say next? What do I do next? You're not used to having people around you, but you know, I think that gets into a lot of that gets into social media and its um, role in fueling incivility. It's a horrible uh, means of communication, even though it's supposed to connect us it more more often than not uh, divides us. I think too much of our conversation is done electronically uh, over uh, text and, and media posts and what have you. Face to face is the best way to have difficult conversations. Um, in fact, uh, it's hard, it's much harder to say something incivil, face to uncivil, face to face, than it is over a media post, because you might get your nose punched, you never know, you know. But, <laughs> you know, you know I read comments you know, on social media from people who are my friends, I, I, you know, and I'll send them message saying, you realize we're friends, right? <laughs> you know, you forget. You forget to seem to forget yourself. 
yeah, I'm not a big, I mean, not, I'm not a big fan of the way that social media influences uh, these kinds of exchanges. I am a big fan of social media. I think it's a really phenomenal uh, advance in the way that we can communicate, but it's kind of in its infancy and uh, maybe in the terrible twos uh, right now in terms of the way that it's, uh, but it's affecting everything. Um, you know, uh, I, one of the things that we really encourage people to do is to push back against the, the, the sort of cultural norms of social media in order to have things be more civil. Social media encourages uh, real antipathy. It encourages um, blocking people, right? I blocked that person. I'm never speaking to that person again. And uh, you, get, you get hand claps and plaudits all over social media when you do it. It's not enough just to block somebody. You gotta tell everybody you block them. Um, I, I think you gotta kind of row against that current. Um, uh, to, to, to try to work toward a more civil kind of exchange. And that's hard because, you know, social media is everywhere with us. I mean, that's what's on my phone right here all day. Uh, every day it's on my computer and on my laptop. Um, you, you have to take yourself out of that frame uh, to have a more civil exchange with somebody. And that's, that can be really challenging. So Rohan from uh, MSU, this I'm going to put a spin on it, but basically, how how do you convince people to be civil and respectful in a world where it seems the only way to be successful is ruthless and cunning? By example, I guess. I mean, you can't force anybody to be civil, but you can be civil yourself. And it's hard to be uncivil to someone who is approaching you in that spirit of civility, I believe. No, it's also about, again, setting your expectations. I mean, you know, back to social media, you know, um, the rewards of social media seem to be attention, right? Um, how many followers do I have? I put that post up, how many people like it or are sharing it? Um, and in order to, to win at that game, you've got to play along with the culture, which is, which is pretty negative, um, you know, I, I think setting different kinds of goals for yourself in terms of how you communicate and what you want to achieve, as opposed to just the number of followers or the number of likes, um, really helps you to move away from that. Now that's hard, right? I mean, um, you know, say in some of, in some cases, our work is measured by how accepted it is uh, these days on social media, and so you can't necessarily always you know, push against that. But I think, especially in our personal spaces, you have to apply a different kind of filter. You have to apply a different kind of sense of reward. Um, you know, learning something about somebody, understanding something better, um, you know, building a better connection with somebody who you don't agree with. Um, those are different kinds of awards that, rewards that social media doesn't count, right? Um, there's no way to keep tally of that, um, but but I think you have to do it. You have to do it for yourself um, rather than rather than for an audience. Right. One of the the last question I'll take, and, and this is I I I'm reading it as a spin on everything you guys just said. But Chandler asks, could there be an incentive for willful blindness in order to receive guaranteed financial or professional backing? You know, sometimes you can't. Mm -hmm or um, yeah, is there, is there incentive to just kind of go with the flow on some things? Of course, it's always the easiest route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's the way that, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think is really great about the last year, but it's also a little dangerous for some people is more people are, I think, willing to talk about how they think and how they feel about these things and doing it in an honest way. Now, that means we're seeing some really ugly stuff um, in some cases, uh, but, but, but frankly, it's better to see that and hear it than to have it out there and not be able to see it. Um, what we need to be able to do is have exchange over it that doesn't you know, degrade to the point where it's not an actual exchange, where it's just a, a clash or a violent clash. But, but it's good that more people are willing to say what they think and what they want uh, and what kind of country they want, frankly. Um, that is the beginning of the discussion.
And dissent's best done out in the open. You allow dissent to go underground and it festers and becomes something very ugly. Well, with that, I know you guys have a hard stop. Thank you so much for joining Thank us you. this morning. Uh, hopefully this was valuable. I, I, I personally had the, some of those questions myself. And so I appreciate uh, both of you, your perspectives and your time. Thank you so much. Good seeing you. I miss Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Karen. Always glad to do it. Yeah. I'll talk to you soon. Everyone, you guys can stay on. I have a few more messages for you. Uh, we have a fun and exciting lineup this week. We have uh, tomorrow is a good, great friend of mine. He's amazing, Musa Tariq. He is the chief marketing officer of GoFundMe. And just they're doing incredible things, uh, especially right now in this day and age. And then on Thursday, we have Lindsay Jones from a Blue Cross Blue Shield, she's talking about employee benefits. So when you get a job offer, what do those employee benefits mean? How do you negotiate them? What do they, what, how do they factor into your overall salary and um, package? So definitely worthwhile for everyone to tune in and watch. I wanna give another shout out uh, to all of our sponsors. Michigan State University uh, is such a great sponsor and, and partner of ours. If you guys are looking for what's next uh, in your careers or after graduation, I encourage you to check out bro.msu.edu backslash black slash Spartans. Um, they have a wide range of highly ranked masters and MBA programs that you can, that will help you succeed no matter what area of business you plan to pursue. They have world renowned faculty members and extensive alumni network and career services team to help you, to help ensure that you excel in your career. So definitely check out what they have to offer. Also, if you have enjoyed these sessions and want to continue the fun, our, our friends at Michigan State have created a similar series called College to CEO series. Uh, we'll put that link in the, yeah, copy that and put that in the chat for everyone to see. Do, do, do. For everyone, there you go. Uh, they will be doing similar uh, programming starting this fall with top CEOs, leaders from all different types of uh, companies and industries and backgrounds. So definitely sign up to receive more information from them about who they have coming up in their lineup. And of course, our good friends at EY, if you're in, if you are considering um, a, the accounting world, they have four integrated service lines, assurance, consulting, strategy, transactions, and tax uh, that they are experts in. Uh, so definitely check them out at ey.com and then our good friends at One Magnify who